Hello, everyone, and welcome to issue number 80 of Anti-Life Reviews. I am the Zarmakaya, Master of Minds and Men, and this is the last week of my comics that they base movies on month. I was considering doing this a yearly thing, maybe pick May to do it, since there are a lot of comics with movies based on them uh, that aren't just the basic superhero fare. What do you folks think? Go ahead and let me know down below. But today I saved the biggest and possibly the best for last. Today we look at the Alan Moore classic in V for Vendetta. Of course, I will be comparing the film with the comic near the end, but this is a sort of dense one, so I'm going to take my time with it. So let's uh, go ahead and get into it. Of course, you know how this goes before we begin. Uh, please subscribe. Looking to hit 400 subs by the end of June. Can that happen? Yes. Yes, it can. So hit the button. Be a nameless, faceless number, probably wearing a Guy Fawkes mask. Now, this was originally published, but not finished, in Warrior Magazine from 1982 to 1985, and then republished and finished by DC Comics from September 1988 to May 1989. The writers and artists on this, of course, the writer is Alan Moore. I mean, come on, what can I say about Alan that I've not already said? He is, and I'll be frank, is unarguably the greatest comic book writer of all time. He took a classical literary influence on comic books and made them something special and different. He took them into a new realm, for better or worse. And with work like Miracle Man, From Hell, Swamp Thing, Watchmen, and so much more, he will stand in that position as greatest for the foreseeable future. Especially with the quality of output comics are doing nowadays, God, we might never see another person like Alan again. And the artist on this, David Lloyd, the man who Anon should worship, devising the guy Fox Mass to become their calling card, though seems to have gone away in recent years. An exceptional artist who didn't have a very long career for some reason. I read a lot of his work on Doctor Who magazine with Alan. Uh, some really enjoyable stuff there, and he did things here and there. A lot of work on Wasteland, which was a horror anthology. But it seems to have just kind of kept to himself for a large portion of his life. Now, I'm going to attempt to not ramble as much. This is a very dense comic, as I mentioned, with a lot going on. So, but I will try to have some brevity here to capture the big beats and not get hung up on the little things. Issues 1 through 3, Europe After the Rain. I'm going to be grouping them by the larger acts as they are presented. Uh, we get a stirring opening by Moore himself talking about fascism coming into fashion in the UK when Margaret Thatcher takes her place as head of the oncoming Reich. It's a sincere, honest take on how bleak things can get, and quickly. We move to England. Endless CCTVs. The voice of fate speaking of quarantine zones, rationing terrorists, and making Britain great again. No comment on that. Evie Hammond is a young woman who is headed out to become a prostitute for the first time. But she's exceptionally bad at it, which is noted by the undercover officers that she propositions. They egress on her, threatening rape and murder, but a man in a mask appears, V, and in stealth, theatrics, and violence, quoting Macbeth, kills a number of them and disappears with Evie. Takes to a nearby rooftop, and she questions her savior, but he tells her the first act is about to begin, and he blows up the Parliament House, as fireworks erupt all over London for people to see. Evie is then taken to the Shadow Gallery, V's hideout, and she is shown his collection of banned books, music, and other paraphernalia. Here we learned all about her and about the war. A massive world war between Russia and the U.S. broke out, with nuclear bombs falling in various places. The U.K. becomes lawless for some time until a fascist group takes over, backed by a large corporation, and becomes the norm, with Evie's family being torn apart and killed because of it. We also meet the leader of this fascist government, Adam Susan, and various members of, of his government, including Mr. Finch, the head detective who will hound V for the remainder of the story, and Louis Prothero, who is the voice of fate, among many others that we'll see. Fate is the central computer that all the government networks run through. It's Adam Susan's personal computer. The people are familiar with Louis as his voice due to his hourly commentaries. A short time later, V kidnaps Lewis, leaving a rose behind first and foremost. He then tortures him and burns his personal, private dolls in a facsimile of a concentration camp that V seems overly familiar with. He leaves Lewis back at his network, but the voice of fate is gone and the people notice. We then get some insight into the leader himself, Adam Susan. Says he believes in fascism. He gives a brief history of it. Says there is no freedom. Not even he is free. He is a servant of his people, sitting in his cage. It's hinted that he is a virgin, and that he is in love with fate. In his own words, She touches me, and I am touched by God, by destiny. The whole of existence courses through her. I worship her. I am her slave. 
No freedom ever was so sweet. We move to V, talking to the old Bailey in the Statue of Justice. He says he loved her, but he has a new love, anarchy. He then blows her and the Bailey up. In the Shadow Gallery sometime later, we learn V's motto, Vivere venverium viverius vici, uh, by the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Excuse my Latin. Uh, <laughs> Evie wants to help, so she makes a deal with V to do so. He mentions how the quote, his, his V, whatever, is from one Dr. John Faust, and that Mr. Faust made a deal too. This leads to him using Evie to infiltrate a high ranking member of the church, a bishop, who is also an unabashed pedophile, since Evie is underage. Of course, this leads to V torturing the bishop before killing him, not before feeding him a wafer full of cyanide. And of course, he leaves a rose behind with Mr. Finch still on the case. We then meet Dahlia, high-ranking doctor of the government, who is doing the autopsy on the bishop and seems taken aback when she sees the rose left by V. Evie refuses to do any more killing for or with V. Well, Mr. Finch comes across something interesting. Lark Hill had been a concentration camp some time ago, and all the people that work there are being systematically killed by V. And one of the names on the list that's still alive is Dahlia. V visits Dahlia that night. She's almost excited to see him. She's not afraid. She knew all these years he'd come for her. She asks to see his face and calls him beautiful. She says she knew, knew he'd come. She got one of his roses today. And another is left behind when she's gone. But so is her journal. With some pages torn out by V. The journal reveals to Mr. Finch the stark reality of Lark Hill. Not bad enough, it's a concentration camp. Medical experiments were carried out there, too. Most people died over a short time until there were only five left, and the man in room five became something of an enigma to them. Totally mentally broken, but wildly enigmatic, charming. He begins helping his gardening prowess unmatched. He slowly gains their trust, access to bleach, ammonia, gasoline. They never knew who was making two things, napalm and mustard gas. He takes Lark Hill down, and Dahlia says, as the place burnt, she saw the man in room 5, room V, and he looked at her like she was an insect. Mr. Finch, in his investigation, had found out V killed over 40 people that worked at Lark Hill. Why did he finally decide to reveal himself now? To what end? Vendetta? Revenge? When will it all end? Let's go over the first third of this story here. Now, this part of the story was originally 11 parts in Warrior, so there's a slight uneven tone to it all. We really get a ton of exposition in the beginning, then nothing in the middle, then a ton of exposition at the end. You may notice jarring changes in what's happening in the story, these real rapid, sharp cuts into the next part. And that's totally due to the way it was originally written and published. Like I said, not as a single comic. It can be off-putting to first-time readers, as this first part in particular has a really bad flow to it. It does, in my opinion, hurt the story, but only slightly, and upon reread, I think it's an easy thing to overlook. The internal dialogue of Adam Susan and the monologue of V about their respective feelings on their ideology is very interesting, as in presentation it's wildly different. Adam's is internal, private, secret, sacred. He keeps to himself as he wanders through the cold world he helped create. Well, V's is garish, vaudevillian. He's on a rooftop having a soliloquy to the Statue of Justice. But in scope, they're shockingly similar. They're both extreme moral ideologues. Not good people, not kind, but with a righteous manifesting as a need to destroy or contain. These are zealots, dangerous in just about every way. I like the juxtaposition of the two, as V is not really treated as a good guy. While Adam is almost certainly evil, there is a faith to him that you can almost understand. It's very interesting and cleverly shown and written. The Lark Hill stuff was really harrowing, difficult to read, to see Dahlia in these two different kinds of spaces as a timid, kind, medical professional versus someone who looked at people as fodder, dismissed them, say they are beneath humans, tortures them. And in such small scope we get on, on what happens there, the depravity, the lack of humanity we see. It's not easy to take him. I want to just go over, <laughs> on that note, I want to just go over some of the interesting media that's referenced or shown in this chapter. I won't be able to do this for every other chapter, as this is really the only one that has a lot of like cool media thrown at. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list, just some things I thought were cool. For banned books in the Shadow Gallery, we see Utopia by Thomas More from 1516, Capital by Karl Marx from 1867, and curiously enough, Mein Kampf by, of course, Adolf Hitler from 1925. For banned movies, though I think it's safe to say all government, government propaganda films are banned, fantasy things especially, but we have White Heat, 
by Raoul Walsh from 1949, Murders in the Rue Morgue by Robert Flowery from 1932, of course, an adaptation of the Poe story, and Son of Frankenstein by Roland V. Lee with Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi, and Basil Rathbone, an epic film from 1939. He also mentioned Sympathy of the Devil by the Rolling Stones. Well, he quotes it, and he also quotes Jerusalem by William Blake, one of my favorite poems. As a note, and this is nowhere in the comic. I think it's only briefly mentioned uh, actually, it's not briefly mentioned in the Miracle Man letter. It's actually in the Komodo, the Miracle Man companion. Fate, the computer that runs all of the government, was created by Dr. Emil Gargunza, who in an alternate timeline facilitated the creation of Miracle Man and Co. I, I, I see this nowhere on the internet, but it was written by Alan Moore and Steve Moore. It's canon as far as canon can go. I think it's very interesting, and I wish more people would talk about that. Issues 4 through 7, This Vicious Cabaret. It opens on a fantastic song, complete with music and sheets for the piano and words. Uh, David J. of Love and Rockets and the Bajas did a version of this that I will have a link for in my description. Of course, it's called This Vicious Cabaret, if you're just looking it up. V, deciding that Evie broke the deal, abandons her back on the street, making sure she knows he is not her father. V then breaks into the national television station and demands they play his tape, kind of like the movie Airheads. He gives the nation quite a stern talking to via television. While the police rain down on the station, they find V long gone. But Mr. Finch is on the scene and punches Superior, who he thinks is not taking the V case quite seriously enough. He's put on leave and thinks of Dahlia, his former lover. Speaking of lovers, Evie has taken one with a man named Gordon. They live together for a small time before Gordon is killed due to a botched business deal. Evie is having a rough time, losing her mind. She decides she wants to kill the man she thinks is responsible for facilitating Gordon's death. But she is captured before she can. She has delirious dreams about her father, about Gordon, about V. All these older men who've protected her in their own way. But she wakes up in what is seemingly a government jail. She's beaten, tortured, her head shaved. They want information about V. She finds a note from a woman in, it, in the next cell, Valerie. It's Valerie's life story, as well as some words of comfort. It's the only comfort Evie finds in this place. It's resolved that Evie should sign a pre-written confession. She refuses, so she is to be taken out back and shot. A short time later, her cell opens. She finds the guards are mannequins, the people who talk to her, pre-recorded tapes. She finds masks, costumes, even her rat is comfy in its cage. Exiting the set, she finds she's in the shadow gallery, and V had been behind her torture all these weeks. He claims he wanted to free her from the unseen chain she has been shackled in her whole life. The way to set her free was to put her through something similar to what he had been through. Evie is broken emotionally, physically, hurt, scared, hungry. She weeps in V's arms. He takes her to the roof, and she stands naked in the darkness, in the rain, a roaring sky. She is transformed, transfigured, and the night is hers. Sometime later, and Evie is now V's protege, she wants to know about Valerie. Was she fake too? No, she was real, everything about her. She was the woman in room four, and V has a shrine for her. In Adam Susan's office, for but a moment, fate says that it loves him. And Evie and V dance as the finale begins. So we clearly have a lot more tight, condensed story in this middle part. Uh, the exposition is almost non-existent. Uh, we know who all the players are. We know what they're about. Let's move forward with some character work and get into the end act. And it was done very well here. There are breezy, these are breezy but weighty issues that form the crux of the emotional plot going into the last part. Don't have much more to say about that. Uh, V's zealotry is on full display here. We see that he indoctrinates all the same as Adam Susan does. We see that extremism is a dangerous thing, no matter the inherent ideology. Extremism is bad, even if your goals are noble. And V presents himself not as a heroic character. He is his pained at in some ways, but the terrorist he actually is. That's not to say V doesn't have a point or isn't doing the right thing. These things are almost inconsequential to the fact he he gets there doing and being the same kind of thing he rebels against. The greater good, indeed. The Valerie stuff and Evie's imprisonment is brilliantly done, totally, completely heartbreaking. If you can read issue six and not tear up, I think you might be a monster. Just excellent writing and really pulls on your heartstrings. No real pop culture references to mention, sadly. There are some, but nothing worth mentioning. Issues 8 through 10. The Land of Do As You Please. 
V destroys the communication tower, leaving the government unable to see any of their CCTVs or recording equipment. It also knocks out all radio and TVs, leaving everyone in, in the proverbial dark, and unrest begins brewing. Then looting, the riots, the government begins executing rioters. Well, that only leads to more riots. The backlash is monumental, as V says. Our masters have not heard the people's voice for generations, E.V., and it is much, much louder than they care to remember. E.V. asks V if this is anarchy. He says no. Anarchy has true order, a voluntary order. This is chaos. This is the beginning. And we finally find out how V has been ahead of everyone thus far. He had access to the fate computer this entire time. Mr. Finch is going to figure out just not just who V is, but why. He goes to the remains of Lark Hill Camp and drops some LSD. He says he's doing this for Dahlia, for the memory of the person she truly was. As it kicks in, he sees the ovens, the endless barbed wire. He sees the people that are gone, black and brown, homosexuals, the different, the differently able. He begs their forgiveness. He says he loves them. So many cultures, colorful, magical, all gone. He imagines a life with Dahlia. He imagines he is the man in room five. He is set free by fire, by explosion, by burning, by torment. The sun awakens a new man. Evie has grown. She's been reading these past months. She's been training. And V takes her on as a kind of, a kind of goodbye tour. All the hidden places, the secret rooms of the Shadow Gallery. To the secret underground chain that is full of plastic explosives. V then says goodbye to Evie. For now, he's going to be waiting for the man. Adam Susan prepares for a rare public appearance, the first in years. People need to see their leader in this time of turmoil. He also forgives fate, his one true love. But of course this goes poorly, as when getting out of his car, Adam is assassinated, ending the leader's reign. Meanwhile, Mr. Finch figures out where V is, all signs pointing to the abandoned train station. And the man V was waiting for arrives. In fear, Finch unloads his gun into V, but it seems to do no damage, and V casually stabs Finch in the shoulder. Telling the cop, did you think to kill me? There's no flesh and blood beneath this cloak to kill. There's only an idea. Ideas are bulletproof. Farewell. But as V leaves, he leaves blood behind, to which Finch declares he killed the monster. The whole government is in panic, trying to figure out what's going on now the leader is dead. Mr. Finch arrives and declares V is also dead. They wonders why V let him kill him. And surprisingly, he won't give any information about where V was hiding. Though the reports of V's death only calm the riots a little bit. In the Shadow Gallery, Evie is not coping well. She doesn't know what to do, though V left everything for her, the whole shebang, everything planned. She imagines conversation with V, imagines who he is. Her father, a lover, someone foreign to her, doesn't matter. In the end, she knows who V must be. The government begins to implode, rivalries coming to a bloody head, political tensions reaching their utmost breaking point. And much to the chagrin, V appears above the crowd, calling for anarchy, for us to choose our own destiny. She then gives V the Viking funeral he asked for, saying, How purposeful was your vendetta! How benign! Almost like surgery! Your foes assumed you sought revenge upon their flesh alone, but did not. But you did not stop there. You gored their ideology as well. Packed in the train full of C4, V's body heads right to Downing Street, where the head of the government is the first fire of the new world. And Evie takes her place as the new V, while Mr. Finch walks away into an uncertain world down a black and distant highway. I want to talk about Mr. Finch and the stuff in Lark Hill. I love this. As a person who abused LSD for a number of years, I never quite had this level of revelatory experience, but I did have some interesting and expansive emotionally experiences. But even beyond that, the narrative, the scope of it, he looks at the furnaces that have been choked with bodies. He sees flesh hanging. What really gets me is when he sees all the cultures gone, all those dead, beautiful things that made life interesting. We see all these people and realize how much we would lose if we had some kind of sad homogeny. It was probably my favorite scene after the stuff with Valerie. It also leads to V's death. I mean, he really had no other way to go. It's cliche, maybe. But his job was done. It didn't. He didn't need to see the new world. It wasn't for him. He was not anarchy. He was chaos. He couldn't be the thing they needed, but he could abuse and manipulate someone to be that. We see some of that cyclical nature of indoctrination at work here, even if it was quite easy to root for him. Hell, at the end, Evie even gets a little protege of her own, Dominic Stone, who was a cop under Mr. Finch. He's going to be her Evie. How many people do you think V had tried that before, but who failed to live up to his expectations? But of course, V's Viking funeral was great, and blowing up Downing Street, the symbol of government in the UK, was a great ending to the fascists. 
Before I go to my overview, I want to talk about Rosemary Almond. Now, I couldn't go over all the political machinations. It's a long enough review, but I want to briefly go over her story. She was married to a very abusive member of the government who had been appropriately who had an appropriately comical death. He threatened her with his gun, claiming it wasn't loaded. Uh, then, he, because he was drunk, he didn't load it, and he got called to deal with V, so he got killed. But we see her life after this, forced to make ends meet, engaged in a sexual relationship with a man she hates. She becomes a showgirl, and while she is, she was miserable before, she was a kept woman, you know? She had some level of comfort. She was in, she was in the good. But now she's no one, struggling. We see her a number of times until finally she purchases a gun, and she's the one who shoots Adam Susan. She's captured for torture and presumably, I assume, killed. All right, the overview. So let's talk about the writing and art right off the bat. The art, David Lloyd here knocked it out of the park. It's simple, almost too simple art, but there are these great hints of detail, like incredibly detailed faces sometimes, backgrounds, moments, and it really gives a contrast that makes it land. But in the same way, there are lots of ambiguous moments that only work because of the vagueness of the art, especially action scenes. He doesn't draw kinetically. It's shadow and hint, and it gives a real sense of tension. I think if I had one uh, mark against the art, is since all the people kind of look samey, some of the lesser important but still named characters kind of blend into one another. It's not a problem for any of the main cast since they have more distinct characteristics. The mask, Evie's hair, and big eyes, Finch's ball, and Adam Susan is a stocky, sort of droopy-faced man. There are a lot of general 30-something white guys in suits that can be hard to tell who they are or care, but that's a minor knock. Writing, it's Alan Moore. It'd be far easier to count the things he did that weren't great more than the stuff he did that was, and even the stuff would be open to debate. There is still reason, this is still reasonably early in his career. He wrote the first part of this concurrently with Miracle Man in Warrior magazine. And while I much prefer Miracle Man and From Hell and Swamp Thing, etc., to V, it in no less takes away from the fact V is exceptionally well written. There is a lot of nuance here, which I'll go over some of that shortly. But there is an attempt at subtlety and to give a voice to everyone, even the people that could easily be dismissed as evil. It's quite easy to write bad guys acting along party lines and, and them all being bad. It's easy to write Nazis and go, well, they're Nazis, so they're all bad guys. They're dicks, and that's it. And, well, that's fine. That's one way to get your reader or watcher to understand who's good and who's bad at a glance. Uh, Alan crafted something different here. There's a sense of subtlety, of nuance to these characters. Not all the fascists are bad guys. In fact, even the head bad guy has a lot of personality that's not totally evil. And the good guy... He's hardly presented as good, or even decent. It's something I feel like we certainly don't see enough of, and frankly, nuance is totally gone in current comics. I've talked about the necessity of political commentary in comics, uh, and Alan is one who absolutely 100% does it all the time. But this is a guy who hates fascism, and he still presents a certain level of, of nuance, because while he hates the ideology, he doesn't hate the people because they are human beings, and oftentimes they don't have a choice. Something I wish current comic writers could understand. Hell, it's something I wish people could understand in general. Maybe we could have some real discourse in the world. I've talked enough about V and Adam and their characteris characterization. But one thing I didn't really talk about was all the political stuff going on. There's lots of plots I totally glossed over. They aren't super important for understanding the plot, but they do add world-building to the whole thing, and there is a tapestry here. We see how this government actually really works. It's not some vague evil government. There are policies, people running areas, etc. It's all very nice. Not just something I wanted to cover in this rather lengthy review, though. Now let's talk about the movie versus the comic. Now, <laughs> I hate the movie. And I was forced to watch it for you folks, so you're welcome for what it's worth. Starting with the plot, the movie takes a shockingly American view on literally everything. The story is inherently British. It's about fascism versus anarchy in the UK, in England. And its very existence is predicated on that. It can work other places, I guess, but it doesn't work in America. We never had a fascism. We never had anything close to it. Nor anarchy. It turns that into neoliberalism versus the alt-right in the laziest possible way. Uh, I think the first problem is the Wachowskis. They're bad writers. Everything they have written is surface-level bullshit. Lazy troops. And there's a reason some of the movies since The Matrix have been utterly f utter failures. The level of writing that works in 1999, which frankly didn't work for me since I don't like The Matrix, doesn't work anymore. And this, this movie had their political feelings all over it, with all of the subtlety that brings. I just want to say I'm glad Trump wasn't president when they wrote the screenplay for this, or Adam Susan's character would be just him. Now, that's no endorsement of Trump. I'm no fan of his. No any politi politician, to be frank with you. But that's about the line they tow. That's about as subtle as they would have made it. But beyond that, none of the people resemble anything even close to the characters. Natalie Portman not only is too old, 
She's American, and she's about as convincing as, as one could be with the script she was given, which is not at all. Hugo Weaving, while I love him, portrays V as a heroic savior of the working class and not a psychopath who's playing the long con. John Hurt's another character uh, wasted. He's Adam Susan's character, but he's called Adam Sutler because it's kind of like Hitler, get it? Oh man, fucking clever writing there, folks. But he portrays the character as a face on TV, a general 1984 bad guy. I'm not going to go over the particular scenes I didn't like because mostly... It's just all of it. The scene where V gets killed, probably my biggest offender, where Finch shoots him in the comic and, and V allows it being part of his plan. Movie, there's this overly elaborate gun battle with the bad guys and he's throwing knives and it's quite pathetic and marks why Hollywood has no sense of perspective. I mean, <laughs> and I want to say this, China didn't even censor this film. And that's how little politically it really had to say. Uh, Alan Moore famously hates this movie, but to be frank, he hates everything adapted from his work. Of course, he has a point. They've all been crap. But yeah, read V for Vendetta. Avoid the movie. Well, that is the end of Comics That Had Movies Month. Which one was your fave? Do you have any other comics that had movies you want me to talk about? Let me know down below. Also, add my Instagram under Demon Peaks for daily. Daily. Twin Peaks meme. Subscribe to my channel and check out my podcast, The Dark Peaks Podcast, where I talk about crack rock and I'm occasionally drunk. Next month, I'm going to be looking at some of the works of Mr. Darwin Cook, starting with DC's New Frontier, Volume 1. So be here or be square. This has been Nathan Micaiah, Master of Minds and of Men. Thank you very much. And goodbye. <laughs>